All right, our third and final speaker, or group of speaker, or just individual speaker, <laughs> is uh, Widya Moko Adi Putranto, is that right? Yeah. Or Coco, as he's, he's asked me to tell him. And um, he will be exploring the work of digital archiving. Now, uh, Coco is a lecturer at the Archival Science Study Program at the University Gajah Mada in Indonesia. He was awarded the Australian Award Scholarship by the Australian Government to pursue a Master's of Library and Information Management at the University of South Australia in 2014. His research focus ranges from preservation, conservation and the relation between libraries, people and social media. Please welcome Coco. So good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Vidya Mogadi Putranto. As uh, Moderator said, you just can call me Coco, and I'm from Universitas Gajah Mada in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the implication of social media platform in preserving Indonesian music as audiovisual archives in the era of streaming. So this is a research uh, done by me and my colleague who unfortunately cannot attend the conference today. So this talk is grouped into uh, four sections. Uh, the first is about the emerging music scene in Indonesia. Uh, the second is about Sounds from the Corner, uh, which is the YouTube channel that is also the main subject of my research. Uh, the third one is about why YouTube was preferred to preserve audiovisual archives, as well as the challenges in using such platform. And finally, the last one is conclusion and some recommendations for future studies. So let's begin with the first sections, uh, the emerging music scene in Indonesia. So how does it all begin? Uh, it begins in the 2000s. Uh, mainstream pop music at the time became stagnant and was dominated by melodramatic melodies and causing young people in need for uh, and in search for alternatives. Uh, during this time, in Jakarta, uh, mainly in the Art Institute of Jakarta, new bands were new bands were emerging with music and sounds that offers different tunes from the mainstream pop and rock music. So these are the bands. Uh, these are the most influential indie label bands at the time. So there is uh, there are Sore, Efek Rumah Kaca, uh, White Shoes and the Couples Company, uh, which have played in Australia for several times, uh, in Melbourne and Darwin, if I'm not mistaken, and Seringai. Uh, today, these bands have become legends. Uh, their music varies from uh, heavy metal, 70s, sweet, uh, rock and roll, alternative rock with social messages, uh, pop punk, new wave, uh, folk, and even swing jazz. Uh, regular gigs at the time were held at the now closed legendary Jaya Pub, uh, which provided platforms uh, for the bands and the fans uh, to meet and find new music. So these bands became popular through high school festival gigs, and the youth uh, across the country start to get curious. So from Jakarta, this band have played shows and built a devoted fan base in Medan, Bengkulu, uh, Surabaya, Denpasar, Pontiana, and any other regions across the archipelago from the west to the east. The supporters of this band uh, decided to make an independent record label for them and start distributing their music through an album format. Uh, Indonesia's leading record labels, uh, Aksara and FFWD, uh, the two in the front, uh, emerge among a network of friends as both collective and individual passions to manage uh, the bands and music they like. So before the existence of these two labels, uh, bands have to fight and uh, send demos to the big labels so that the labels can represent and market their music uh, to radio play. 
Uh, these indie labels, however, often utilize the internet and live shows around the community to build a fan base. Uh, the founders of the labels admit that their decisions is highly related to their passions and belief in the emerging Indonesian music at the time. So uh, they say that everyone then wants to be the musicians and no one really has done management and documentation. Uh, in this space or era, the bands have used and acknowledged social media as their platform. It's free and available and can reach audience across the globe. While almost all leading bands in other parts of the world recognize uh, the popularity of MySpace to connect with their fans in Indonesia, it was the independent or the indie bands who mainly used the platform to interact with fans and introduce their music. The mainstream, art the mainstream artists and big labels otherwise were satisfied with national television and radio exposure. Uh, so take an example of this band, uh, Pee Wee Gaskins, uh, whose music were listened by more than a million people and gained popularity from this social media of MySpace. So the popularity and trend of the bands uh, invite people to want to know more. Uh, the documentation begins with this media uh, they include music reviews, band profile, band interviews, show dates, uh, and any other else. They provide the opportunity for fans and the bands to connect and build a bigger community and reach a wider audience. Some of the examples of these documentations are magazine. Uh, there is Ripple magazine, which is the most famous uh, magazine for documenting indie bands at the time. And then for online-based media, we have uh, www.rockstar.info. Uh, it still exists now. And we also have radio and other uh, DIY zines as well. Uh, however, 10 years have passed, and the Indonesian music scene has entered a new chapter. This is the chapter which begins because the major labels have less power because of the fans do not buy music anymore uh, due to piracy and later eventually streaming services. Uh, so the music industry has changed. Uh, MTV at the time is irrelevant because people watch their favorite music uh, videos through the internet. Publicity marketing has shifted. So let's see a sample case from the band Mocha with their label. So the pen made a thousand copies first, and then they sold 500 copies on the first day, and then the rest 500 were sold in a week, and in a matter of months, 5,000 copies were sold uh, to 10,000 copies, and eventually to 100,000 copies. Uh, so it's pretty amazing, isn't it? Uh, but well, in this transition time, a group of people decided, uh, brought up an idea, uh, which brings us to our next section. So our next section is Sounds from the Corner. Uh, so Sounds from the Corner uh, is a YouTube channel dedicated to record the live shows of Indonesian bands. So it is a collaborative independent team consisting of producer, videographer, and recording or sound engineers. Uh, the project members have long involvement in the music industry and independent scene. The project combining both major labels and indie bands, and it is promoting potential and emerging artists. So the founders of the Sounds from the Corner are involved and are fans of the music scene. This allows them to propose uh, the idea of recording the bands uh, to be much easier. Uh, while the mainstream pop music have the television and national media to capture the live uh, shows, that wasn't always the case with smaller uh, independent bands. So following the footsteps of those indie media 10 years later, uh, this group of people, uh, the Sounds from the Corner, decided to spend their own money uh, to address the emerging Indonesian music scenes. So while the documentation and media have been more than enough to capture the bands 
and the community at that moment, the numerous energetic live shows in which they perform haven't been entirely well documented. Mostly the archives have a very little information and are documented with poor quality and several bands might have decent documentations of their music but not their live shows. And if they do, the archives are never made public. So there is simply not enough well-documented live shows for these bands. And this is the first serious independent project that is aimed solely at documenting live music shows in Indonesia. So we conducted interview with the subjects in order to obtain a more insightful data. And here is what uh, Dimas, the videographer, and one of the co-founding members of Sounds from the Corner said, uh, I used to enjoy a lot of cool kicks in the early 2000s, and when the party was over, I hardly find proper documentation to rewatch the kicks I went to. So I start documenting them one by one. So in a country where music archives and documentation are lacking, uh, live music shows will be even more fundamental and wanted in the next five until 10 years. And the relevance in the streaming era. So uh, documented live shows are equally accessible online, provided a different experience by seeing the artist performs, thus adding a certain level of connection with the fans. So a video of live performance takes into account a number of aesthetic values and has the important task of capturing and delivering the spirit uh, of nuance of both the music and the performance of the artist so that the audience can experience the show as if they were present during the shows itself. And the one that I have stated before, in the increased values in the future because uh, the lack of the audiovisual archives in Indonesia. And regarding the curation aspect, uh, since beginning of the project, the principle of this project uh, is to promote emerging mus musicians or bands with good music and potential without being limited uh, either to major or independent labels. So it means bands from various backgrounds, uh, level of popularity, genre or character could be chosen. Uh, Michael Baskar in 2017 argues that the excess numbers of everything today change definitions uh, of creativity from creating to curating. Uh, the audience demands do not necessarily affect the SFTG team's decisions in choosing the artists, interestingly. And when we try to analyze the impacts of this project, uh, the works of Sounds from the Corner have raised the artist's awareness about the value of archives and archiving. So they start uh, being aware about the importance of the archives and for the artists themselves, proper archives are essential as a portfolio both for documentation and promotional kit uh, for future marketing and sustainability. The other impacts are, the first is uh, inspiring people in other regional areas in Indonesia to document live music shows in order to introduce and promote local musicians. And Sounds from the Corner also giving free workshops on recording, documenting, and producing live music shows across the archipelago. All right, now let's move on the main discussion of how social media platform like YouTube can be beneficial for the kind of projects that uh, Sounds from the Corners does. Uh, so why YouTube? Why using YouTube? Well, there are at least four elements to consider. Uh, the first one is popularity. Uh, this means that YouTube can reach a wider audience than any other video-based platforms and thus introducing the artists uh, to more people. The second one is accessibility. Uh, it is easy to use and accessible uh, throughout all devices as long as there is an internet access. And YouTube is definitely user friendly. And the last aspect is financial reason. So, well, not only f 
it is free, but uh, it also provides monetizations. Shim based on the number of reviews. And Burkhardt also says that YouTube keeps various contents of music collections in one centralized space. So the YouTube comment sections allows the channel and the bands to get feedback and have direct interactions and immediate input from fans or the audience. Uh, this typical dynamic social media environment uh, allows interactions between users to be very fluid and everyone could also browse for contents without having to sign up. But why do they use YouTube, not others, uh, video channel like Vimeo? Uh, they admit that uh, they used to be obsessed by Vimeo, but in terms of numbers of the audience, YouTube are accessed by a significantly greater number of people. So Sounds from the Corner was created to provide reverence of music documentations, so reaching as many audiences as possible is the main priority. And using social media like YouTube, however, offers several challenges, uh, namely sustainability, archive storage, uh, funding, and the last one is the imitators. So from the sustainability context, uh, it is important to note that YouTube is a third-party platform, and there is definitely risk that users have no guarantee it will long last for both technical or non-technical reasons. Like uh, in Indonesia now, uh, the government block uh, the, the access to female as well as to Tumblr. So we don't really know whether YouTube will be blocked in the future. And however, with YouTubers now becoming a profession and many people relies on it both as the video creators and consumers, uh, it can be argued that it will only be getting bigger. So Indonesian government has blocked Vimeo, another popular video-based online service, due to alleged uh, inappropriate content. Recently, they also blocked the social media Tumblr for the same reason. And on the other hand, creating their own website, they admit, uh, would be the last choice for them because uh, maintaining their own website requires sufficient resources that uh, sounds from the corner currently still lacks off. So Dimas, uh, one of the co-founders, uh, was evidently confident about the future of YouTube as a third-party platform for their project on preserving live shows of Indonesian artists. Uh, he said YouTube is only getting bigger now, so we are confident it will take a while until it loses its appeal. And speaking in the storage context, uh, Sounds from the corner realize uh, the big risk of possible data loss in this short term. So they admit, interestingly, that all of the archives of this project are in uh, one of the members' personal hard drives. So only one who have the uh, archives of the everything. So he realizes there is from this centralized storage, but uh, Sounds from the corner don't have sufficient funding to improve the storage system and network at the moment. So speaking in the long term, uh, they actually would like to have the archives to be uploaded in the cloud so all of the project members could have the access. And speaking in the term of fundings, uh, Sounds from the Kernel uh, has formally earned sponsorship per production cost in several sessions through partnership with uh, big companies However, uh, they admit that YouTube monetization doesn't significantly help them. Uh, instead, they primarily use their own funding or product endorsements. So uh, it can be argued that the project sustains because it is treated as a project, not a job. So all of the project members, they have their own uh, daily job, and they just treat this as their side project, not for profit or to gain any money. And there is also another challenge in terms of imitators or similar projects. So uh, this is interesting because on one hand, uh, it can be argued that it's good 
to the Indonesian music that many people now pay attention to live show archiving. However, on the other hand, this type of projects uh, tend to be more profit oriented and arguably have lesser quality than the sounds from the corner. So those are the two other similar projects. The, the first one is uh, entitled clickclip.com and the other one is Locaswara. So the conclusion is, uh, the first is that live shows documentation will be increasingly important for future generation of musicians and fans, in addition to the development of popular culture. Second one is that the Sounds from the Corner sustainability highly relies on their knowledge, passion, and collective spirit. And Sounds from the Corner can benefit from coaching new talents to ensure the sustainability and future of the project. So the findings provide new insights of how the use of social media is influential, both for the audience preference, as well as the tool to raise the awareness of the need to have proper documentations and archives among the community of Indonesian mus musicians for various advantages. So what's next? Uh, what for the research I think we can explore based on this topic? Uh, the first one is uh, the government intervention. Uh, should the project be regulated? I mean, uh, if they need funding, should they just ask the government? Is it the government's responsibility to do such project? The other one is uh, the partnership with communities from other countries. So it would be exciting to see project growth by having a collaboration with artists from overseas. Uh, additionally, it is important that they learn best practices from international archiving uh, against this. And the last one is the physical space or museum-like building, probably. Uh, do they need permanent physical space to exhibit the archives? And if yes, how would it be? Uh, not only for storage, but also for educational purpose. So lastly, I would like to end this presentation by quoting uh, Baker and Haber, uh, who say that if popular music culture is generally a culture of the people, then its preservation in the hands of the people seems appropriate. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, and I welcome for any questions.